right? Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, we are going to have a discussion session on a paper and project that is called Peritex, um, which was a thing four of us did together. That is Jeffrey um, from MIT, um, Slim, who is uh, Berkeley now, I think, are you? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Peter van Hardenberg, um, who runs the Ink and Switch Lab, uh, and myself uh, at the time at Cambridge. Um, but this project was all done as part of Ink and Switch, um, as part of our general exploration of local first software. Um, so probably if you're listening to this, you're probably familiar with local first software. So the idea that we want apps like Google Docs or things like that, but without Google just being able to lock us out of our, all of our files and all of our data at a whim. Um, so keeping the data on our own devices and being able to synchronize via any types of servers. And so we, uh, in particular, like Google Docs is just an example app, but it is actually quite close to what we were looking at in this uh, Heritex paper, because what we've wanted to do for quite a while is collaboration on rich text. Um, so rich text being simply text with formatting, uh, such as bold, italic, uh, you know, comments that you might put in the sidebar, embedded tables and images, et cetera. <laughs> I think the comments one is actually a good one to to actually pause briefly on, which is that you don't need rich text to need rich text formatting, because comments turn plain text into rich text in terms of their technical requirements. And so if you want to be able to do proper comments in VS Code, you need this kind of rich text, like uh, formatting spans kind of model in one form or another. Yes, exactly. And I know from the research history point of view, this is a really weird thing. Like, there's been tons of uh, academic research on how to do collaborative editing of plain text, uh, where plain text simply means you know sequence of characters where you can insert and delete characters anywhere in the sequence. Um, and there's virtually nothing on collaborative rich text editing. It's it's a real contrast between the two. Even though it seems like you know obviously useful app, everyone uses rich text editors on a pretty regular basis. Um, so why there hasn't been more research on it is, is a mystery to me. But anyway, this is a, a bit of a hole that we have tried to fill in this project. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe would one of the others like to talk a bit about like how we got to working on this? And uh, I could give some, some background yeah, maybe because I, I was the one who recruited for this. So yeah. we started in on this a few years ago. I actually found a notebook from Strange Loop 2019 that had um, my first real serious attempt to implement this with Irakli Gozala, who I think was then at Mozilla and these days is at Protocol Labs. Um, and it's one of those problems that I really just assumed that if I ignored it, somebody else would solve because it just seems like such an obvious deficiency. And, you know, like when you run a small research lab, that's more of like a like a band of pirates than like a, you know, Microsoft research, you know, all encompassing Death Star, you really got to like pick your project. And so I was really hoping that I could just not do this, but we kept like poking around the edges at it and failing quite badly. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like it should be straightforward, but a lot of the intuitive um, designs that we came up with, which look good on our sort of example use cases ended up falling apart you know, once we put them to the, you know, stronger kind of proofs and, and more rigorous testing. And uh, maybe we'll get into some of the like backstory of the failures along the way. But uh, yeah, so it was just really upsetting that, that we had to do this in the first place. And at the time, we managed to recruit Jeffrey and Slim to come do a project at the lab. And Jeffrey, do you remember how we got onto Paratext in particular? Because I don't think it was our first pick. I honestly, I don't remember the details, but I, I can say, you know, to fill in a little more context for why we were interested, why I was interested in this work, there's this bigger vision here, which goes far beyond what we were able to do in this Paratext paper, which is about um, asynchronous collaboration on text documents. So we had this hunch that, you know, um, back in the old days, you edit on Microsoft Word, uh, there's all these problems around version control and sharing, but at least you get to sit down at your desk and write and no one else's cursor is like running around your screen, right? Um, and then we sort of largely moved to this Google Docs model where tons, tons of people are using live synchronous collaborative 
online editors these days. And this solves a lot of annoying problems with the old way. You no longer have to worry about whether you have the latest version of the file. Um, you know, there's, uh, you always know what everyone is seeing. You know, everyone's seeing the same thing. That's all great. But uh, it also turns out that editing live with other people is sometimes really annoying and not what you want. Um, some people find it hard to write in that setting. Also, um, you know, there's there's not really a, a rich concept of branches or any kind of version control of a document. Um, there's some loose, you know, weak versions of that concept in things like Google Docs, but really the primary metaphor is like one thing that everyone's constantly poking at, right? And so we felt like that was not an ideal editing experience either. And so, you know, I've, I've been interested for a while as someone who writes a lot of papers with people and who, obsesses over the edits that are happening and trying out different versions of an intro or things like that, that, you know, um, could we make tools that are better for that kind of workflow? And so that's that's part of why we thought this work was important to work on. Um, and, you know, in the end, I think we started out the Paratext project thinking, what if we just solved all of that in three months with two people? Uh, and then uh, over, over time realized that, uh, there's a little, a little more than we could bite off. There's ongoing work on, on more of that, but that's that's some of the origin story. I, I would say that one of the things that I, so very much agree with like what Jeffrey was saying, the, something that was really appealing to me about the vision for um, the CRDT based model is that thinking about all of the different kind of editing features that you could implement in terms of these granular um, merge, primitives. So for example, like suggestion mode in Google Docs, like Jeffrey was talking about earlier, is something that you could think of as, oh, you know, here I'm going to, I I as like another actor, I'm going to make all of these proposed like micro edits. And then other people have the, have the ability to like choose, you know, preview what the text would look like with different sub variants in line um, and then merge them. But like the underlying, you, you need to do interface work, of course, but the underlying technical primitives can be very much expressed in terms of like what we're talking about here. Um, the other the other thing is like, sometimes when I am writing collaboratively, like Jeffrey was saying, you know, I don't wanna see all these other people's cursors on my screen. But um, one thing that I was noticing when I was doing collaborative work with people like at uh, through research or, at, or at, at, at my company or things like that. Um, there are cases where I maybe am actually okay with other people seeing what I'm writing as I'm doing it, but I don't want to see their cursors and have everything kind of bumping around. So there's like a, a one way uh, information flow um, or conversely, um, I would maybe selfishly like to see what other people are working on in the document as we're all working on it, but I don't want them to see what I'm doing because I'm still like flushing out something that I feel like maybe like really insecure about the, the phrasing or something like that, right? And and and, and there are all kinds of um, there are all kinds of like these social dynamics that arise in collaborative writing settings that are existing models of like either you are online and synced or you are offline and working in your own editor don't allow you to support, um, but that something like a CRDT based uh, interface would actually permit. And, and so I, I'm kind of interested in like understanding these different forms of like social flexibility and that as they arise and how they could um, produce these kind of interesting, interesting like collaborative writing settings. But the sort of underlying, the, the, the necessary first step is to get like the technical primitives working. And so I, I was like, we should probably focus on making a like an algorithm that works. Yeah, and I should note in passing that now that we have this at Ink and Switch, we've been uh, starting to actually build um, sort of the next phase of these projects into um, knock-on prototypes um, and we're getting a lot of mileage out of it. So I will say, although we have a working implementation, there's still a lot of devils in the details to get right and actually making it fast and making it reliable and you know merging it into mainline auto merge and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing I found very interesting, at the, especially in the early phases of the project, um, Slim and Jeffrey, you spent a whole amount of time interviewing uh, various professional writers and trying to get their insights into writing, didn't you? Do you want to yeah. say we a few share words a little, Yeah, that? we talked to... Um, Unfortunately, a lot of that got cut from the paper in the end, um, but I think you actually had some really cool insights there. Yeah, I think some of it will come out in a future and can switch piece at some point. Um, we tried to talk to people who write together who weren't 
like us. So both of us had, for example, written a lot of papers together, but we are with other people, but we had talked to um, journalists. We talked to screenwriters for podcasts, you know, um, and, and it's just shocking how different the, the requirements are in these different contexts. I, I um, you know, really vividly remember there was this investigative journalist who was talking about how if they change one word in a story, it could expose the entire organization to like legal liability. And so the editors are like extremely careful with, um, you know, how they control the editing of the document. But uh, there's this sort of disconnect where despite that level of caution, the tools that they're using are often incredibly, incredibly primitive, um, even down to the level of, you know, oh yeah, that editor doesn't know how to use the CMS, so he will just send back his comments in line in an email with edits bolded, you know, that kind of thing. Really, really primitive tooling. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, it was, I think we learned that there's such a diversity of collaboration patterns out there that I, mean, I think ultimately what one one thing we ended up landing on is that it's really hard to imagine a single writing tool that works well in all these cases. What you need is like some sort of compositional toolkit that allows individual teams some flexibility to create the workflows that work for them. Um, I don't know, Slum, do you want to add anything to uh, talking about those interviews? With I would say that like, it was really interesting to talk to people who just had such like a, a diverse range of experiences writing. So like, like as an example, we, we talked to a bunch of people who were journalists um, and were primarily describing the feedback loop, uh, the, the loop of like working with their editors. Um, we also talked to someone who works at a like podcast where uh, she's, she's part of a writer's room with a bunch of other people just like riffing on different ideas for like sketch comedy and like podcast ideas and things like that um all kind of physically co-located before the pandemic and then once the pandemic sorry is that buzzing me i can't hear any buzzing i don't know i, okay. I, I, I hear the i was hearing it as well yeah okay sorry i just want to make sure it wasn't something i was doing um uh and and um we talked to someone who was like a a social sciences uh social science coll who collaborates with uh does like HDI research, but collaborates with people in the social sciences and the kinds of like the kinds of writing practices and norms that they have there. Um, and I think that I was very something that was surprising to me, I guess, was um, the many different ways in which people like. There's a very personal preference in terms of how people get feedback. Um, sometimes, sorry, sometimes this is a personal preference in that I would rather write my whole thing and then submit it to someone and get the feedback. Um, and and then you know move on. Oh, and sometimes it's like an institutional preference, like what Jeffrey was describing with the editors, where you're like, okay, I have a bunch of editors kind of descending on this and, and micromanaging every word. And um, like the tools that we use just like don't at all align to those feedback styles, which is perhaps an obvious thing to note, but um, I think was really it was like very striking to me how people will be like, okay, we use, uh, we use Microsoft Word because that's what everyone does, or we use, um, uh, th that's what everyone does in publishing, or we use um, this like uh, homegrown editor because that's what everyone at our, at our, at our publication, you know, news publication uses. Um, and like, oftentimes it just like does not work, let alone support the right like granularity of editing or collaboration primitives. And people will just like make it work maybe by like writing text, like in line in the body but like that is that is really designed to be more of a comment, like in in all bold or all caps or something like that. And then so you know, many you have to interesting do workarounds. Exactly right. But so so the so the, the sort of the the plethora of workarounds that people introduce that are just like clearly suboptimal, but are designed to adapt these like underlying primitives that are kind of have like an impedance mismatch with our desired workflow. Um, that was just really interesting to me. And by by talking to people who did like all kinds of writing that was very different from ours, I was it really underscored like the, the diversity of these workarounds. Yeah, that's that's great background story. Um, so for everyone in the call, by the way, if you have any questions or want to discuss any particular points, feel free to just jump, jump in. Otherwise, I guess the, the four of us will just keep like riffing on things. Um, so I see 
is that David who just posted in the chat um, saying uh, things that are semantically meaningful to the participants, but perhaps not outside the participants. Um, sorry, are you referring to like the, uh, the comments uh, put online? Yeah, comments or, you know, other things where people will, as a group, choose particular ways of expressing this is a comment uh, versus content, whatever, within the bounds of the tool. But they they have this, you know, kind of uh, stealing a, a phrase from Chris Micklejohn, who gave this awesome presentation um, about uh, filibuster, his uh, microservice testing uh, framework. He called it a socio-technical problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are a lot of things where if we have, if we hit, if we bump into technical limitations, we then flip over to the socio side. Hey, let's agree on a way of expressing comments or, you know, giving feedback or something. I think it's and important to contextualize all technologies as spanning social and technical bounds, right? Like democracy and the idea of giving comments and the etiquette about what you can put in comments, like so much of the, these processes runs in the meat, so to speak, and not in the computer. And one of the things that we have found a lot in our work at the lab, and you know, there's a great paper, um, what was it, Formality Considered Harmful is the title, Jeffrey, which goes into this. But like, I actually, I have a great admiration for these socio-technical solutions because, you know, they're people making the most out of the infrastructure that they have. And oftentimes those like, you know, policy governed as opposed to technology governed solutions are more flexible and adaptable over time to meet the changing needs of like groups and their um you know evolving process so i i, I like mickle john I, I always like anytime people point at like it's actually a people problem because uh, it's always a people problem at the end of the day um but i always okay, feel but... a little a little weird about like separating the people problems from the technical problems i i, I don't know that there's a separation i think there's a gr gradient hmm. but we also see this in the million startups that have reinvented the spreadsheet except constrained it to perform a particular set of things and realize that no really people use spreadsheets because they are unconstrained mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so maybe um moving on to well, rich text so we've talked about like the motivation of wanting asynchronous collaboration and things like that but then it turned out that it was actually quite a long journey in terms of actually finding an algorithm that worked and didn't have all sorts of ugly edge cases. Uh, who wants to start talking about that? Jeffrey, Should I start you? with OFS? I think that was the uh, yeah. first wrong thing. Yeah, why don't you talk about OFS first? So, okay, so you got rich text and you're like, come on, it's just like SGML or HTML. How hard can this be? Why are you making such a big deal of it? You know, just throw some tags in there. Bob's your uncle, you're good to go, right? Like what's 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 all the fuss? So, you know, you put a bold and then you put a closed bold tag in line and, you know, that's fine. Um, except it's not fine uh, because it's, uh, it becomes very difficult to tell if any given piece of text should be bold or not. And what we found as we sort of explored this model was, okay, well, you know, if you have three open bolds and then someone sees the text as bold, it's very hard to preserve kind of the expected behavior during merges of this model. So like, if you imagine just like a plain text piece of formatting and let's say star, you know, is bold and slash star is unbold. If you just start inserting these into a document, you end up with like, you know, you might stack up a bunch of bolds and then have a bunch of unbolds afterwards, but then you know, if you have overlapping spans, you get very surprising outcomes from this. So you think, okay, well, you know, this is where we got into what we called the ordered array of formatting spans. So what we said was, okay, well, we'll we'll pull all of the markup out of the document. Pair text paper already talks about how you can't do that, but we'll, so we'll pull it out, we'll put it into an array, and we'll just apply all these formatting spans one after another in causal order. But that doesn't work either for a different set of reasons. And again, you kind of get these like weird corner cases where you expect certain things you know the thing you're trying to preserve is that like if a person sees a certain thing in their document and then takes a formatting action that when you merge in changes from other people you get something that at least approximates their intent 
So, you know, a bold doesn't mysteriously become an unbold that you can't remove or something like that. You don't have like a span where someone deletes text in the middle of it that happens to overlap the end of a bold span and all of a sudden everything is bold because now the span has no closed tag. And so you get all these kinds of weird corner cases. Do you remember why OFs didn't work, Jeffrey? This was the first real like concerted effort we had to build. I have something. a I have a picture. Can I can I share oh, my yeah, screen? Sweet. <laughs> um sorry, but I guess this is a, a rare inversion of the can may dialectic. Um let me see if I actually can share my screen. Um the so keynote. Well, okay. Let's see. Let's see how this works. Um, are are people able to see this? Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So, the the thing you're seeing here is basically um, a some we have some text, the quick brown box, and these bars that say like bold, not bold, bold, etc. Correspond to editing actions that people are taking, and the ordering of the bars in terms of like how they're stacked vertically uh, corresponds to time. So in in the in the upper example uh, we first do this bold then we do this unbold then we do this bold and then in the in the example below the order of those things is reversed and so you actually end up with very different outputs depending on the order in which you perform these actions um specifically it looks like this uh and the thing that is a problem with the order to rare formatting spans or in general any representation of the document where you're just kind of looking at the boundaries of these operations um, is that you end up with if you if you if you look at like the, the 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 boundaries that arise in the text they're identical so you're unable to distinguish between these like temporal orderings um even though as we've saw in the previous slide right they they these identical boundaries give rise to like very different outputs depending on the order in which the uh the operations were applied and this is sort of the fundamental problem with the vast majority of approaches that seeks to represent uh, that they're like, okay, why do we need a rich text specific, uh, rich text specific data structure? Can't we just use one of the many plain text data structures and one of the many existing markup languages that allows us to delineate, you know, formatted regions of that text and just like apply those. Um, and so this is, I, I would say like, this is the fundamental problem, which is that you collapse the, you can, you can collapse these positions into like, the, the the inline character buffer, but you lose all of the temporal information that allows you to distinguish between outputs. And then as soon as you have multiple people collaboratively editing and an editor that wants to like render the formatting and so on, it gets like even more complicated. Yeah, um, I have a few edge cases as, uh, as well. Actually, I gave a talk um, on this just yesterday and made some slides for it so I can uh, show you those briefly as well. Um, so one attempt you might do is represent it as a tree because uh, you know it is a it's it's a DOM tree, um, so you can have a paragraph node and then a text node containing some text, and then let's say a user bolds the word jumped, uh, so the fox remains unbold and the word jumped is uh, made bold, and concurrently the user B uh, italicizes the same word jump, and now how do you merge these? And if you take most uh, tree data structures, collaborative tree data structures or CRDTs, what they will do is something like this. So they will preserve the fact that you deleted the word jumped from the from the first text span. They will preserve the fact that you inserted a bold uh, node into the tree with a child jumps, and they will preserve the fact that you inserted an italic node into the tree with uh, text jumped. And so the end result is now that the word jumped has become duplicated, and that's probably not what the users intended. And so that's like one example of what can go wrong if you use just a generic tree data structure. So let's try something else. Let's try using markup for has it, having markers which tell you where this where a particular formatting span starts and ends. And so take as example this document where you have the fox jumped being bold and then over the dog being non-bold. And here the user A on top decides to unbold the entire string. Uh, whereas the user B on the bottom wants to unbold only the word fox. So that is the word fox in the middle of the bold string becomes unbolded. So you would do the unbolding everything by just removing both of the bold tags. 
but you would remove, you would do the unbolding of a single word fox by adding a end bold before the fox and an uh, start bold after the fox. And now what happens if you merge these? Well, we preserve the fact that user A removed the two outer uh, bold tags, and so those tags are now gone. And we preserve the fact that user B inserted uh, an end bold before fox and a begin bold after fox. And what you can end up with now is this situation where you have first an end bold tag before without a preceding start bold. Okay, I guess that can happen. Um, and then you have a start bold tag, but no end bold tag coming afterwards. And so the result is now we've bolded everything up to the end of the document. So potentially almost the entire document has suddenly become bold, even though the users only changed a few words at bolding right at the start. So this is a bit of a mess as well. Okay, let's try a third attempt. Let's try attaching individual formatting operation individually to every single character. And this is probably going to be expensive, but whatever, let's just try it and see what behavior we get. So let's say that if you want the fox jumped with jumped bold, you would attach a bold flag to the J and the U and the M and the P and so on individually. And what can happen here now uh, is some interesting thing happens if you consider comments. So we talked about comments earlier where you might select a span of text and leave a comment in the sidebar. Um, and in this case, user A does exactly that. They leave a comment and we would also represent that comment, ta comment object somehow by having a, a flag on each character that's associated with that comment saying there's a comment attached to this character. And concurrently, another user might insert a word. And so in this case, user B inserts the word brown into the middle of the comment span concurrently. And what happens if you merge these? Well, now you end up with the comment span getting split because the characters that were inserted into the middle of the comment span, they didn't have a comment attached to them at the time when those characters were created. And so now the, this uh, span that was you know, originally supposed to be one contiguous span has somehow become split into two separate comments. And that doesn't really make sense either. And so, uh, yes, you might be able to work around this as well, but it seems like all of these, op these attempts to create some, some kind of workable algorithm just seem doomed. And we kept just finding more and more counterexamples of where things failed. I think one thing that's maybe interesting to touch on, which I don't know how much we covered in the paper itself, was just like a lot. It's hard to describe formally what your invariants are, right? Yes. Like all of these are are totally valid CRDTs, right? You merge the data and you produce the same output at every node. So that's a good CRDT, but it's not what you want, right? And so like. Format it how I want is like a relatively un, uh, underdefined um, specification. And so since we didn't really understand exactly what we were trying to do, we kind of had to proceed intuitively and discover through failure modes when undesirable behavior occurred. Do you want to, Sarah or Jeffrey, do you want to talk about that? I mean, yeah, I can. So if you go read the Paratext paper, there's a whole section where we try to define what we want um, so we propose something. It's not like it's objectively the best thing you could want. Um, there might be other opinions on what the results should be. For example, you know, so that example Martin just showed where someone inserts a word in the middle of a bold. Th there's no like mathematical reason why the word in the middle should be become bolded. It just seems to us that that's the right thing to do. Um, another, another, I think, important point around this though, is that even the best automated invariants that we can come up with in the context of editing text are very weak. So what I mean by that is people are writing asynchronously separately. They merge the words they wrote and we have no idea whether the meaning makes sense, right? Like two, two, two words being inserted one after the other could be complete garbage grammatically or you know conceptually even if it like technically the letters are all there and the, you know if the formatting is reasonable and so um i think there's sort of a mindset to keep in mind when thinking about asynchronous collaboration where people aren't constantly seeing each other's changes that in addition to doing the best job possible of having this low level reasonableness we also need to build tools on top of that those low level properties that enable humans who can think about stuff to 
get to an actually good output from the human perspective. Um, this isn't to say that the low level, the low level properties don't matter though. You know, if I write stuff and it disappears, or if I bold something and then we merge and suddenly the whole document is bold, that's bad. And even if we get the bolding right, the document still might be garbage, right? And so that's sort of an interesting, um, like subtle tension around the invariant. Yeah, I think one thing that came out of the follow-on research that, that I'm now quite convinced about is that if you want to support asynchronous collaboration in your product, you now have to build a version control system. You cannot escape this. You will have to solve it. Now, what version control system means is going to vary from organization to organization, product to product. You might just need to be able to explain why you have bad results. You might need a way to just dump the bad results or choose between two. For example, iCloud solves this problem by showing you the timestamp of the two different files and then telling you, you know, pick one. How? The, the Dropbox approach too. Yeah, just pick pick one by the timestamp. What, you you don't memorize the timestamps of all your files and exactly what the content's for? Well, that's your problem. Uh, but, you know, there's no getting away from it because you cannot safely merge arbitrary content. And so one thing that's with our solution for peritext that we ended up with, which I think actually plays towards this goal of having version control, is the idea that uh, we regard formatting as a monotonically growing set of formatting operations. And essentially, it's an evolution of this uh, ordered array of formatting spans um, idea that uh, PVH started off with right at the beginning. And um, the nice thing ab about this approach that we ended up with is that, uh, so say some text was bold and then it's unbolded again. We don't un represent that unbolding by removing the fact that it was previously bold, but we remember it by adding to our knowledge the fact that it was previously bold and now it has become unbold. And so that actually then gives us uh, not just like nice CRDT merging behavior, but it also gives us the ability to look back in time and see like what was a past state of the document, what, what, what did the document look like three days ago, and what are all the changes that have been made since in that time, um, so we can get efficient diffs and the fact that we can just represent the, the operations that the user performed, like to bold or to unbold something, um, as essentially just a log of operations that makes it just so much easier to do that uh, sort of diffing and versioning. Jeffrey, uh, what what was it? I, okay, so the, the story of the paper is that Ink and Switch hired Jeff and Slim over the summer to work on this problem and write a draft of the paper. And then Slim went to grad school and Jeffrey went back to work on his PhD. And then in September, we were all kind of collaborating sort of low bandwidth, like part-time, like working on the draft of the paper. We thought we had solved we it. Do. We thought we'd solved yeah. it. Do you remember how we realized that we were screwed? I think I do. So. Um... There were a couple things that happened. Um, yeah, we were, you know, oh yeah, time to write, edit our draft and put it on the website. One thing that happened was um, Martin pointed out some bugs that he found. And in mm -hmm. particular, um, there, were, there were a couple subtle things that we got wrong. Um, one of them had to do with tombstoning. So um, we had not thought enough about what happens when characters are getting deleted from the text and there's formatting uh, that starts and end in, ends in those deleted regions. And that causes these like new problems that we hadn't thought about. Um, the second issue that came up was, and I actually, I was looking back over our Discord chat, and I think this originally was brought to our attention by feedback from a couple other people like Kevin Jans and Seth Gentle, who've thought a lot about CRDTs. Um, one of the things that both of them brought up was around um, span expansion. So um, this is referring to the idea that in an editor, if you have some bold text, and you put your cursor at the end and you start typing, you're gonna get bold text coming you know, when you type. So in a sense that bold is growing to, to include those new characters that you're typing. Um, and in a typical non-collaborative editor, this is sort of, it's a pretty simple thing to do because at the editor level, you can just make those characters bold. It's kind of like one of those slides Martin showed where you can just consider every character bold, it's fine. But in our model, it's preferable to think of that as the bold span that was there growing on one end. 
because we want to be able to preserve these nice properties we have. Like if someone else inserts in the middle, that text also being bolded and so on. So the, the implication is that we had to think a lot harder about what happens on the edges. These are literal edge cases, right? Um, what happens if you insert at the beginning, at the end? Um, and there's a lot of subtlety there. Um, one of the things that I think is easy to miss in the prior text paper was actually really important is that um, if you go look at our pictures, um, formatting spans start and end on some character, but there are two handles attached to every character, one kind of on the left side and one on the right side of each character. And you can attach a formatting span to either the beginning or end of a given character. And that turned out to be the kind of critical breakthrough for making this all work in a reasonable way. We tried a bunch of other models, but basically when you only have one handle per character that spans can attach to, things get very confusing to reason about because it's hard to imagine you know, what should happen when text is edited on the end of a span. But the moment you have these two handles per character, everything just kind of falls out very nicely. I remember you know, when we finally landed on that idea, it's one of those things where if you have the right data representation, the right kind of like um, sort of model for the problem, a lot of nice things just sort of happen, fall out of that. Um, so that, that, that ended up being a really important iteration that we had to do. Um, once we realized span expansion and tombstones were important, and we reached that two handles per character idea, uh, things went a lot more smoothly. We had to massage a couple of final edge cases, but that was basically the final version that we landed on. Um, and then we had to make the code correct, which was another uh, separate problem besides getting the design correct, right? Um, Peter wrote a fuzzer that found mm. uh, bug after bug exciting uh, where different users would diverge from each other if we applied events in some way. Um, but it was really fun writing a fuzzer. I'd recommend it to anyone. I honestly approached it with some skepticism when I got started, but it turned out to be a real asset. It was incredibly helpful. There's no way we would have found those code bugs without it. Um, I remember just being on a train, like running the fuzzer, finds the bug, fix that bug, run it again. It runs for a minute longer, but then it finds another bug. And yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, the, the story of the tail end of the project. I think we had a couple of places where I think we had conceptually the right ideas in our heads, but um, but the code was just didn't reflect those ideas correctly. And then there were other places where just our conceptual idea was totally wrong, and um, and we were thinking about it in the wrong way. And like we went back and forth between different representations several times. Like I think the idea of like do you mark the start and end of a span as control characters that are embedded in the sequence of mm. characters or as by externally just referring to the IDs of the start and end characters. I think that's one thing that we went back and forth on must have been like three or four times. Um, yeah, we almost returned to control characters when we realized that we needed to expand spans because the nice thing about control characters is in a very simple, naive way, if you imagine like you mark the span with control characters, it's like, oh, if you want it to expand, just insert characters inside it and it will naturally expand. And if you don't want it to expand, just insert outside of it and then it won't grow. And that seems very appealing, but it turned out to have all these other problems. Um, so. Yeah, which is if you insert six of those control characters and they might overlap and then you start typing at the margins and then you merge, how do you make sure you're not inserting text into the middle of a mess of like enable and disable build control characters. Exactly. That's totally non-deterministic result. And I think that's one of that's like a good example to show one of the problems with the control characters is, you know, you might have one place in the document, one conceptual location where tons of different formatting is changing, like a bold is ending and italic is starting. And all of those things are actually happening in one location. But if you use control characters, you're required to assign an ordering within the document one character at a time to those span ends and beginnings. And they might, again, they might not be in the right order. Or you might not be able to insert in between them. So things get really messy. We need to look, by the way, at the new auto merge implementation for that problem in particular. That is a good reminder. I'm going to make a note. So the, the, there are a couple of things that come to mind after this discussion. The first one is a joke, which is an off by one error. Because, you know, having to put the, uh, you know, treat a character not as a point but really as a, each character is in, in and of itself a span is interesting. But kind of putting the, the comedy aside for a minute, it's striking me that we're trying to solve this problem with data structures that we know. 
and we know trees, we know graphs, but it, it's feeling to me like there's another data structure in here someplace that we're like try, that we're taking a sledgehammer and we're sledgehammering, you know, trees and graphs and before and after. In other words, not really knowing where the character is and you know, if you have a series of these control characters, should they really be represented in one point? Is a point really valid if we have the before and after? And, you know, it, it, if I'm replaying this incorrectly, let me know. But it, it's it, it's really feeling to me like there's probably a different data structure that we should be looking at for representing. And I, I, I don't know, I, I don't have any clue at all as to what that data structure is, but it's just feeling like, it, we're trying so hard to pack this thing in and it's not quite fitting. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts on this. Oh, sorry, go yeah. ahead, No, you can go, Slim. Oh, I'll, I'll go after. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a sort of general purpose CRDT design principle that we pulled in here, which maybe go, hints in that direction of the, of the, the other data structure in there. Um, which is, if you look at what Peritex does on a, on a kind of abstract level, it's two CRTTs. Uh, firstly, it's just a plain text CRTT containing the textual content, the characters of the document. And then separately, it's the formatting spans that are attached to it externally. And now the formatting, for textual content is just an existing text CRTT. We don't need to do anything there. Um, for, the, for the formatting spans, actually, it's just a monotonically growing set of operations. Um, so that's actually a super simple structure to work with because, you know, we, it doesn't matter in which order you receive the formatting operations. We just dump them all into a set. The set has no order. And then we define a function that som somehow determines, uh, or it computes deterministically, uh, given the text string and given this set of formatting operations, what is the current formatted text? And then as long as this function is deterministic, and doesn't depend on the input order of the operations, then we're guaranteed to always get a CRDT. It, you know, it might not necessarily be a well-behaved one, but at least we can guarantee quite easily that it converges. Um, and then as an optimization, then as a second step, what you can do is, okay, if we now have uh, the current formatted state of the document and the formatting operation comes in, what is the minimal incremental set of updates we need to perform uh, to the formatted document, document uh, to the formatted document, so that the end result is the same as if you had recomputed it from scratch. Um, but I found that that was quite a helpful principle, and I, I think the implementation does actually still have those two code paths. There's a compute from scratch from the entire set of formatting operations code path and the incremental code path, which is the making the minimal necessary update. The incremental one, by the way, is so important because the text editors are so expensive when you send them full formats. Yeah, so the incremental is super important for performance, but I would argue that the from scratch is super important for understanding and getting it right. Yeah. Well, uh, Slim, did you want to? Yeah, this was more of like a meta kind of meta comment about um, finding like a good data structure so i the way i think about it in general is that like you have data structures like um to, to, to use an example that's often associated with text editing you have like ropes or something like that um fundamentally you have a tree right and you have you have a binary tree but uh nodes are augmented with additional information like uh, a length or a weight and um information about like the you know something like You'll have a tree and it's like got oh you know a metadata field that includes the sum of all the weights in the left subtree or something like that and the the way i think about the kind of approach we were pursuing is um you start with like these really basic data structures like lists and trees and over time as we sort of added additional we were like hey what is the you, what is like the minimum amount of information you need to include like additional information you need to include to be able to like efficiently represent or e first tractably then efficiently represent um and perform all of these different operations and over time once we like as we kind of went through this process uh this is what like jeffrey was saying um we sort of like 
we cycle and Martin too, we like cycled through like all of these different, oh, you know, maybe we actually need to, we need to have like two handles on this one. Maybe we need to store, we, maybe we only need kind of a separate normalized uh, list of all of the formatting spans with references to IDs. No, actually we need to take those spans and store them on the characters themselves, that kind of thing. And so over, um, over the course of like figuring out what information we needed associated with it, I think it would have been too premature to be like, what is a more sophisticated data structure either that already exists or that we would invent um, in order to represent these things. And then once you go through the process of kind of like figuring out what metadata you need to shoehorn where into a very simple data structure, that is what sort of establishes the groundwork for you to think, okay, now what is like a more elegant optimization or formulation of this um, that would allow me to like capture the data structure invariance and then do the same thing, like information theoretically the same thing, but in a more elegant way. While we're on this topic, I might add one thing, which is there's sort of, at least for me, an unresolved question that Peter has brought up a couple of times, which is, are we actually solving text, rich text specifically, or is this actually an instance of a more general problem? Something like, you know, you can look at what we've done as like develop a CRDT related to sequences and spans in those sequences that can overlap with each other. Um, I think one example PDH has mentioned is like, is this, I don't know, is this collision detection or like, are there other domains where you could use the same data structures? Um, the answer to that is not really clear to me. Um, a lot of what we did is pretty generic in terms of, we don't care if it's bold or italic or colors or links. There's a sort of, um, there are behaviors that these marks can have when they interact with each other, but we're not specifically focused on like, it doesn't have to be text. Um, on the other hand, some of these behaviors like spans expanding on the edges seem like they might be somewhat specialized to text. And in general, text ends up being pretty weird and specific in a lot of ways. Um, and so my current leaning is that it sort of is worthy of its own special treatment essentially. And it's okay, it's, it's special enough, but um, I don't know, something to think about. I think so because rich text does occur in so many other types of app as well. You know, if you have a spreadsheet, if you have a vector graphics editor, if you have presentation software, you know, everything has a rich text editor in, in it somewhere as well. I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to argue the opposite. I think your argument is good, but I will at least stand up for the opposite and say that I think that, uh, I think that this problem of like index spans into data is a general purpose tool and that the ways that it can be employed and deployed are so varied across different domains and that rich text is sort of actually a mirage that seems like a thing when you look at it from afar but as you approach it becomes increasingly clear that there is no such thing as rich text there is only prose mirror text or notion text or you know whatever godforsaken flavor of markdown you've inherited from the person who came before you gold mark markdown versus github markdown or whatever and so i think we can do a lot to make those things intercompatible but you know the restrictions on, in terms of like what you can nest inside of what and which kinds of formatting are supported and you know whether you have a block quote or a pull quote or you know what kind of fields you need to set as metadata on various things these all vary tremendously from editor to editor the actual the true underlying technology is that you need to be able to tag a span uh and then you have to compose up on top of that and so to me i think it's it's actually an i am coming to believe that this is an application layer or a library and framework layer on top of a fundamental CRDT property, which may also have further applications in other places. But we also need it for ephemeral data, like spans for selections in collaborative things, which may or may not be written in the CRDT. So I think I'm, I'm increasingly of the opinion that it is not rich text, but merely spans and marks. So first of all, Slim, I love your analysis totally awesome. And I agree that exploration before anything else is always a good thing. Um, to Jeffrey and Peter's point, I think a lot of this is how the semantics of how humans interpret different graphic compositions, for lack of a better phrase. And you know, it'd be very interesting to see how well this stuff 
uh, how well the stuff um, holds up with um, right to left character sets. In other words, are there a different set of semantics in right to left character sets? Are there a different set of assumptions that writers using different character sets assume? And I, I, I vaguely remember, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact reference, but in one of the CRDT papers talking about um, if there's a quote before a period, there's a different algorithm for kind of dealing with some of the span mechanics than after. I, I don't know whether it was a quote or something, but there's like these very subtle things in the way that humans process information. In other words, punctuation actually has a different character meaning to us as humans than the the letters, you know, the, the letters that make up the words. And so I, I think there's a lot of subtle encoding of the things that we take for granted. Now I'll, I'll talk about like the subtle encoding. Um, you know, if you talk about um, the short green cat, you don't see the green short cat. There's like actually within English, a mostly unspoken, generally unwritten rule about the order of um, adjectives. I think there's a lot of these subtle rules that are being being discovered as we're going through to say different formatting has different meaning. Anyway, I, sorry for the, once again, I'm, I'm, it, I, I don't have a conclusion here, but it, it, it's an observation about kind of really the, the difficulties of the subtleties of the problem that y'all are trying to solve. A maybe more um, like abstracted, uh, if, if you think, so I think going back to our earlier point about the socio-technical gradient, um, the things that you're describing are very much on the like social side. There is something that is kind of like a little more to the technical side, but still a little, little bit social. And this arises um, in terms of what Jeffrey alluded to earlier, where we have two handles per character, um, which allows you to treat different types of formatting marks uh, differently, depending on whether you're kind of, uh, depending on how you want it to expand. So for example, um, people often in like, for whatever reason in existing editors, you give like bold, you send bold text, you put your cursor at the end, you keep typing, people will expect the bold to, to keep going. But if you have a link, you put your cursor at the end, you keep typing, people don't expect the link to keep going. Is there that, that a was, like that, that, that was the example that I was looking for. Sorry for interrupting okay, cool. you. That that was yeah, yeah. perfectly the example that I was looking for. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so like, so so I think this is like, it, 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 and there's there's no like, as Peter's saying, right, there's not a principled or mathematical reason why you want one or the other. It's sort of in a crude expectation that has been shaped sort of incidentally by the tools that we have used in the past. Um, but it does kind of speak to like these uh, unspoken, these expectations where you, you, you notice when it's violated, right? Like you notice when you're using a jank rich text editor on some website that was kind of poorly implemented and you're typing and all of a sudden something is, exp is expanded and you have to like hit enter, type a new thing, copy the unformatted thing, paste it in some weird workaround, right? Um, but like a lot of this is actually just like understanding the kind of expectations that people have around these, um, understanding expectations we have around like how different types of formatting should behave, but then asking, okay, what are the technical primitives that you actually need in order to be able to accommodate this range of expectations? And so it is subtle because you don't actually realize that it's helpful to have two adjacent handles between characters until you realize that people expect bold and uh, hyperlinked spans to behave differently. So that's kind of the, the, the design iteration that we went through. Um, can, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, regarding like this uh, limitations, because I believe I, I suffer myself also the, uh, the, um, the problem of trying to uh, implement something similar in uh, in the web technologies, right? So um, I don't know if you explore anything related to something like this, but in other um, in other mediums, because I I kind of have this like feeling that the web technology like create a lot of constraint around, for example, the two handle thing. Because that's something for most rich exciters like um, yeah, it's it's 
is a hanging like a cursor hanging selection so it's something very um uh, included into how things are implemented in the web i have i don't i don't have too much like experience in other mediums like for example like a um, other type of uh, um, like uh, uh, programming languages or or some other mediums like Canvas or something like that that also have that limitation or is is there something like just intrinsically inside the web that um, that uh, um, pivots or 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 constrain a lot this the query text? I think we I, did. A I don't yeah, think there's anything super web specific in all the cases we've talked about so far. I, there are definitely tons of low level issues with text editing on the web. Uh, I think Slim's like probably the expert on those issues on the call here. Uh, or Slim. But <laughs> like all the stuff we're talking about, I think is pretty like conceptual. Like it, these are questions of what, how do people expect text editors to behave? It's not mm -hmm. like we're being constrained by like, like we didn't have really any problems with uh, this, the text editor library we're using or content editable or anything. These were problems of like, when someone types here, what should appear, right? And so um, I think that basically we were operating at one level up of abstraction and relying on uh, mainly ProseMirror, which was the editor library we integrated with to hide us from all the web stuff as much as possible and let us just deal with, you know, operations on a text buffer, basically. Um, I, I don't think we know. did have a look what other platforms do as well. I vaguely remember digging around the documentation of Apple's NS attributed string, which I think yes. does a, a similar kind of thing for iOS uh, and uh, macOS. Hmm. Uh, another question that I have is like related to user testing, like how how was the approach to to user testing Praytex, for example, because it is very abstract. And how, like, um, what were you expecting in order to see that, okay, this is, this is what we, this is our assumption and it's working or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I can speak to, you know, during, while we were developing the project, we just had a, a demo running, which is like two text boxes and we can type into them and see changes going back and forth. And we use that ourselves to test it out. Um, we didn't really use it that much or have other people use it that much. Um, and I think in retrospect, that was a bit of a mistake because um, for example, the behavior around spans expanding when you type into them, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't realize how important that was because we weren't using it enough to actually uh, edit text with. So we probably could have realized that earlier. Um, it's a really hard problem and an ongoing yeah. concern we have at the lab, which is that we're doing this cutting edge work and trying to build things that kind of work in short order but at the same time it's hard to make things reliable enough to you know like you have to really use the thing in anger to find out if it's good and if the thing that you're using as a crdt for rich text that's full of bugs and runs in like you know exponential time on its data set it's very hard you know you're not going to be writing your next like paper in there for fear of well you'll definitely lose all your data and if you're just pasting in whole blocks of like data that's pre-formatted, you're not really going to learn about all those bugs anyway, right? You really need to use it. And so it's it's hard. And I think you don't actually need that much user testing on this low level of a CRDT. I think where you need a ton of user testing is when you build tools on top of this that are like, what's the UI for asynchronous text editing? That's where you need a ton of testing with writers to see what actually makes sense to build on top of this. But yeah. A lot of the CRDT conflict resolution logic focuses on like obscure edge cases, which really in a in in a good collaboration session should be extremely rare. Um, because generally, you know, two collaborators should be trying to stay outside of each other's way and not be editing yeah. each other's text. Um, so we kind of have to address the edge cases just because like they, you know, they might occur and we don't want really pathological behavior or inconsistency in those cases. Um, Hmm. But but yes, I think then as in making real collaboration software, there's there's the whole social communication problem of how you make collaborators aware of each other's edits. Um, that has fairly little to do with the low level CRDT implementation details. Yeah, and, and 
Uh, last question that I have written. Uh, so uh, I I was really it was really interesting looking at the social technical problems. Uh, like this is the first time I I heard this term, and also um, uh, Slim talk about the the desired workflows that usually writers have. So how how do you think uh, um, a CRDT a rich text CRDT uh, algorithm helps? to people doesn't go through social technical problems and try to solve their like something in in a social in a social way instead of just relying on 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 the technical part or 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 try to even don't think about it and just like it's solved you don't have to think about it because it's already there i could maybe comment a little on this uh unless anybody else is, is raring to go i think we are at the infrastructure level here, but we did a little bit of initial user research and basically identified a bunch of problems. And then we wanted to work on those problems, but we couldn't because we didn't have a rich text CRDT, right? So this is unblocking technical labor. Now that we have a rich text CRDT, we've started exploring that in subsequent projects. When I say now that we have a rich text CRDT, I'm being somewhat generous. Um, <laughs> engineering wise now that we understand the possibility of a rich text crdc and have several yeah. extremely sketchy prototypes that kind of work some of the time uh we have tried building things on top of them with moderate success uh not to throw any shade at paratext or the people trying to build on it it's just hard to build these things but i think um like broadly the view of the lab is that this is there exists an imagined system in which these faculties are foundational and where you know we think a lot about like what why do we do this research into local first software it's because we want computers that work this way and it's not enough if every app developer has to build from scratch around these local first ideas we need to have whether it's frameworks or toolkits or a platform or something that provides these facilities in a broad way and so that means not just building these CRDTs, though that's obviously necessary foundational work. It means also exploring the user interface consequences. It means figuring out what the, the user-facing nouns and verbs are that allow you to compose up, you know, meaningful software on top of this. And, you know, if you wear like a Notion, you know, product manager hat, it's like, okay, well, now that you have the CRDT, you can start thinking like, great, we don't have to just send whole blobs of JSON for each block one at a time. And clobber other people, but now we need to figure out kind of how you represent that and how you deal with conflicts. And, you know, you need a way of like, you now you can do it, but now you have a new problem, which is that you have to do it and you have to figure out what that means in your product. And so I think we're going to see a number of kind of point solutions rolling out in various like products over the next few years as people digest the potential of this technology. But I think that the long-term goal the lab has is to articulate a vision of a system that provides this as infrastructure across a wide variety of different applications and where you know developers can just take it for granted as you say and build on top of it but that is very much an ongoing program yeah also like um to i don't know if anyone else have a uh, comment on that because uh, um i i have a comment on the on the general pur purpose uh, crdt algorithm not just for rich text, but for anything else, but for something else. Um, I believe that the, if if we uh, see like formatting as layers, we can also translate this to maybe 3D editing or 3D uh, engines. Right, uh, exactly. So when you, when you, when you apply sh shaders, when you apply lighting, when you apply things, that could be also a good uh, indication of, okay, this, this algorithm or this CRDT can work on those type of scenarios, but I, of course, that's a, uh, a completely different uh, uh, setting. But uh, again, if we if we uh, uh, generalize the things into uh, there's something that you apply layers to uh, in in rich text is a text you apply layers to in in um, in three D editing is just a, a shape you apply layers to. It's it's kind of a similar thing and could be interesting too someone to explore because yeah yeah that's an interesting idea um so if 
gone just over an hour, I suggest that maybe we gradually wrap it up, um, unless anyone has any more burning things they want to talk about. One thing that I, was not in the paper, which is hot off the presses research that we haven't written up yet, but that is relevant to the interests of the people here, uh, is that in the paper we talk about not having implemented uh, block formatting. Um, in, was it in Vancouver that you cooked this idea up? Or was that you and Blaine talking? Where did this block formatting yeah, come from? I, I think so. Uh, actually, also, I had um, post lockdown, the first in person meeting I had with Alistair, my collaborator in <laughs> Cambridge. Uh, we were just talking about this uh, and it didn't have anything. But then on the cycle ride home, it suddenly had this uh, idea on how to uh, do block formatting. So that is like paragraphs or bullet points or block quotes or things like that. So the, basic the annoying challenge... thing with those is that, sorry, do you want to? I, I think I think framing the basic challenge is important. The basic problem is that, you know, with bold and italic, you can be bold and italic, you could be neither. But with blocks, you should always be in exactly one block ever at a time. You can't be in two, you can't be in zero, you're always inside of a block. So really, fundamentally, there's a modeling challenge here, which is, you know, if you have a list item and then another list item, you never want to end up smearing the two together, no matter what kind of formatting operations come in in what order. So with that context, maybe you can explain the approach. Now. Exactly. Well, and yes, and the other thing with block formatting is that blocks can split and be merged. So you can position your cursor in the middle of a paragraph and hit enter. And now you have two paragraphs and you have to handle that gracefully. So you don't want to end, end up with duplicated text, for example, which is what you would do if you use the the sort of tree move algorithm like what I showed in on the slide earlier. Um, and likewise, you could have type backspace at the beginning of a paragraph and join it onto the previous one. Uh, so you need sensible ways of handling this sort of splitting and joining um, of blocks and at the same time making sure that you don't have partially overlapping things because it doesn't make sense for some text to be partially in a, in a bullet point and partially in a numbered uh, list item. Also, that's just a nonsensical thing. Um, hello, can, can hello? you hear yes. me? Uh, Bernhard here, I do have a bit of a problem with my video, but I try, uh, uh, I'm on the road, so I, I do have bandwidth problems. I'm very interested in, in this Paritext work and I, I really like it and also uh, like how it is written. And I'm very interested in this block formatting because um, in the past I worked on a, on a style text editor, which you can only do formatting by applying styles, nothing else, but uh, character styles and paragraph styles. The idea is that you can uh, define your character sets for different type of use cases. And um, once you define a character set, uh, a style set, sorry, a style set, I mean, then you can only apply those styles which are in the style set. Um, um, I'd like to use it for building a requirements editor for software requirements documents, this type of things where you want to have very specific things where you like um, hyperlinks to special other um, requirements, uh, domain model things. And, and so I, I guess for, for, the, for the character styles, uh, the, the paratext as it is uh, described in the document would be very, very fitting. And, but for the, for the, for the paragraph styles, I, I guess uh, block formatting will be indispensable. And I'm, I'm really uh, very interested in, in that, um, that direction. Also, um, one, one comment I would like to make is that um, I always wanted a, um, um, a text editor where, where I do have, um, uh, mm, so the cursor moves, um, I have to, 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 to uh, I have two character positions for this, uh, for this um, span ends so that I can, I can, I can position the cursor either at the end of the first of the, of the, of the span or at the beginning of the next span so that I can decide uh, in which span I'm, I'm going to edit. Uh, I guess I'm, uh, there was one editor, which I, I, I tripped over where you could somehow control this by if you if you uh, by which um, by moving the cursor either from the left or the right and then um, but I think um, I think some work would be needed in text editors to be able to to um, so the text editors themselves should be more 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 uh, smarter to 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 do this really 
So um, I'm always annoyed by, by this um, hyperlink editing in different text editors. It's, it's always not doing what I want to do. And uh, I guess it's also interesting. But uh, yeah, thanks. Just wanted to say it's great work. Looking forward to, uh, yeah, to the progress, which, which, which it makes, hopefully. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, the in terms of the positioning your cursor either side of a, a formatting boundary, that's exactly where this distinction between uh, external spans and control characters inline comes in as right, well. Right. So that is, if you want that, then the control character approach uh, works better because it allows you to select at the time when you're typing whether you want to go before or after the control character. Um, yes. And yes, about the paragraph formatting, maybe we should follow up, up separately after this call, then we can uh, discuss. Yes, it would be very interesting. So well, briefly, but, but still I think the we have, we, if you're interested in looking at, we haven't published anything uh, formally, but um, if you follow up with me, we have a, there's a small demo repo we're working on that at least has some of that code in it. Um, we'll mm -hmm. probably try and write something about it at some point, if I can convince Blaine, or maybe Martin will do it. Blaine seems hard to pin down for that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it'd be a, a, just a short addendum paper, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. you can actually look at the code in um, this auto merge repo project I've been poking at. So it's, it is at least visible, if not well. Thought. Okay. So it's going to fold into auto merge itself? That's an interesting question. I'm just going to say yes. Uh, in, what, in some form. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Okay. The, the answer depends on who wins the argument about whether rich text is a thing or whether the faculties that allow you to su support rich text is a thing. But in a sense, it's kind of an irrelevant mm -hmm. argument because either way, there'll be some code out there that's documented to support this. It's just a question of whether it's like part of auto merge on the documented right. API or built on top of auto merge as a documented API. <laughs> so uh, it will be, it'll be out there soon. But it certainly makes sense to have some a uh, well-defined way of handling rich text. And yes. yeah, it could be a separate library, it could be built in, whatever. That's that's detail, but it needs to be possible. Official and supported. Yeah. And I'm very pleased actually to mention in passing that Alex Good, who's on the call here, um, has recently joined the team working full-time on industrializing auto merge. Historically, we oh. have our remit as as a research group is not to do industrial work, but just to roll on from one half-built prototype to the next in search of you know great truths of the universe uh, which is fun but ultimately doesn't create a lot of usable software um, and people have been adopting auto merge in spite of that because it's almost usable software and now alex is making it actually usable software by uh, adding like documentation and release processes and closing out old github branches and things like that as well as merging in and implementing the kinds of features that people who use this thing in the field are are asking for so that's very exciting and we're delighted to have him and uh, if you're the kind of person who is using auto merge in production or would like to, you should reach out to him. You don't need to sponsor the lab to do so, but if we get enough sponsors, then we don't have to go start a startup, uh, at least not right away. And that probably makes it easier for everybody to uh, continue to use it in the future. Okay, well, this has been a really great discussion. So I suggest we wrap it up there. Um, so thank you all for joining. It's been excellent. And uh, we'll see you again some other time. Thanks for hosting, Martin. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for hosting. Cool. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good to see you. Thanks. Bye.